is um, my lecture on Old Ironsides by Oliver Wendell Holmes. I tear her tattered ensign down, long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. It's the first stanza of the poem. Um, today I want to talk about it in relationship to, again, our next essay, of course, um, leading us toward examining poetic elements, um, not imagery, but any other poetic elements, and to see how that helps us to understand the poem. Um, when I come to a new poem, um, <clears throat> I know that I like to read the introduction as we have a brief introduction to our text. Um, the reason, one of the reasons this is a cheaper text is because the introductions are so brief, they don't tell us a lot. Um, but here we have some information about this, um, this poem. And um, so let's look at what this Old Ironsides refers to. It refers to the USS Constitution. It had sur survived um, a number of battles in the War of 1812, and because of that, it became known as Old Ironsides. It was not made of iron. This is a ship that still sails, still doesn't really sail. <laughs> it it um, goes out once a year and turns around. It is in port all of the time in Boston Harbor. Uh, I have been on this boat. It's um, The Navy keeps it commissioned. It is an interesting historical place to be. Um, you can see here, I chose this photo of all the ones on the internet because you can kind of see its size relative to people and it's actually out instead of docked. So I thought that was interesting. So here's a poem about specifically a thing, right? Something that um, people at the time knew about, okay? A historical subject and then looking at who this person was Oliver Wendell Holmes his son goes on to be a um, Supreme Court Justice but this one is um, mainly an essayist and a doctor he works as a doctor and he studies and he writes a lot of essays about medical um, procedures in the 1800s um, and becomes a member of, establishing member of what they call themselves the Boston Brahmins. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Um, <laughs> anyway, Brahmins, and which um, is an intellectual group in Boston society. Um, the term Brahmins refers to the highest caste in, in, um, in India, so it's a pretty racist word to be using. Um, but again, he's mostly known for his essays. So one of the things that's very interesting to me to consider, and uh, one of the reasons I chose this poem is because I did not think any of you would choose this poem or would want to choose this poem to write about. Um, maybe I should have, though. It seems pretty, it's not difficult to understand. But what I would mainly say about this poem is that I'm surprised that it is included in the 100 best poems of all time. Um, of all the poems we've read so far, there have been times when I've read a poem and thought, well, I don't know if that's the best of that author, but this time flat out, I just don't understand why he's included. By this way, not, I don't have anything against Wendell Holmes, but I, um, the poem itself, I think is pretty, uh, mediocre as a poem itself, but, um, let's see if in our investigation we can figure out what, why, our editor might have included it. So let's go on to the historical background. So um, this was the battleship was about to be decommissioned, which is, means it's broken down and used for scraps. So Oliver Wendell Holmes writes it in protest. He's 21 years old. So he's around your age and he's just in a snit. And so he cannot believe they would consider doing this. And so he writes this poem off. And when he does, you can see the fourth bullet. The important thing is, is that it, the reason why I think it's included in this collection is because it becomes so popular. It becomes popular quickly and without anyone kind of pushing for it to be popular. People just 
grab onto it and like it. Um, and then this last bullet, I think, explains a little bit why that in 1830, when he published it, people at that time, right, was, was the United States was just starting to figure out who it was. We had just signed um, the treaty to end the Revolutionary War about 33 years before, um, 37 years, anyway, not 40 years before. And so we were a fairly new nation and we were trying to figure out who we were. And so having this symbol of Americanness became pretty important. And so I think the poem became popular because it coincided with a patriotic feeling as people were starting to feel connected to their nation a little bit more. And that is why I think we still talk about it today. Again, not necessarily because it's the greatest poem ever written. Um, interesting also to me, um, I'm happy to talk about this idea that he had a very specific purpose, right? Your purpose, why does someone write this? And in this case, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote this to persuade the public to, to protest, destroying the ship and selling its parts for wood scraps. He wanted people to stop that. And so he writes this and kind of protested, how can you take this majestic ship and just make it into a heap of nothing? But poetry in general does not do that, right? So this is kind of, um, I think poetry, I just wrote down what I thought, why poets write poems. I think they feel something, I think they're meditating, it helps them to remember, it helps to try to capture a feeling and to help other people feel the feeling. I think though there are protest poems. I think there are poems written when people are frustrated and want to affect some kind of social change. In this case, it's not so much social, I guess, as historical. Um, but there are other poems that are out there that are trying to affect change. And his is just so blatant. So I thought that was interesting. So even though, like I said, I don't know that I think this is the greatest poem ever written, I think it's interesting to consider the fact that it was written with such a specific purpose. And what does this tell us um, about the poem and why it's considered great? Um, and I think this right here, this what I'm saying here, the purpose is, is as close to a meaning as we can get, right? Um, is not as close to, it is a possible meaning. Okay, so let's look at some other elements. We've talked about this previously, a form. This happens to be a ballad, right? It has three eight-line stanzas, but each stanza is actually quatrains. Remember, quatrains are four lines, and the second and fourth lines are rhymed. That's what I'm talking about here. And the ballad, you've probably, I hope you've heard the word ballad before. We still use it to talk to so about songs that are on the radio. Um, but ballads uh, are very musical. That's a, a lot of songs people write today have that rhyming scheme too, where it's every other line rhymes. Um, ballads in the past have tended to address heroic and romantic themes. And um, so that connects to him trying to convince people um, that this is a heroic ship, right? And it's um, romantic and we should, that's why he wants to convince people to hold on to it. And the, I think it's really important that this form is kind of simple because he wants it to be something people can remember and relate to. So I think the form is really important to how he achieves his purpose. Symbols we talked about before. I just mentioned a couple here. You can see them. I think they're kind of interesting. I think the ship itself represents the United States, right? And as does the final bullet you see there, the eagle that's talked about towards the end is also, I think, a symbol of the United States. And, and so, um, and then the ensign, this type of flag, a naval flag, it stands in for the whole of the USS Constitution in that first line. And um, the USS Constitution in representing the US represents its ideals, right? The virtues, like freedom. Um, and then this last part right here is something uh, we'll talk about when we get to the last stanza where I think things change. 
you can see some of these symbols, um, how they are used to emphasize the uh, majesty of the U.S. and the ship, which stands in for the entire United States. So you can see why people, if they thought that the ship represented the country, why they would not want it to be destroyed. Here's a new poetic element that I'm introducing today, um, alliteration, the repetition of initial consonant sounds. And here are some examples. I just have two examples, but there are more than this even. One is there's a alliteration is when you have this repetition of consonant sounds. So the words have to kind of come within a line or two of each other and to be considered repetitive. So we have the words banner, beneath, battle, burst, right? Those are all B words. They come in the, um, in the very first stanza, that banner in the sky, beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The ba ba ba. That sound is like it's like a hitting of the the artillery. Ba 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 ba. Which is supposed to make us feel the attacks of the other ships and the battles that this ship has been through. So it's trying to appeal to our senses in the same way that the W's do in the. Um, oh, let's see the second stanza. Sorry, the second stanza. Uh, when winds were hurrying o'er the flood and waves were white below. So when when winds were, waves were white. All those whoa, 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 whoa. So it makes us feel the whoa of the wind. It's supposed to make us feel those things, like appeal to our senses. Again, this is trying to get us to convince us to feel what this uh, ship has been through so that we want to stop it being destroyed. And just some other smaller ones. Uh, I, I put imagery is not small. This is a huge part of the poem. But since we've already focused on that, and that was the focus of essay one, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the imagery, except to say that overall, all the images sort of add up to this um, romanticized, uh, it's, it's battle imagery, all of it is, but it's romanticized. It's not realistic. It doesn't actually take into account the realities of the battles, like in the battles that the USS Constitution fought in 1812, it lost as often as it won. Um, so it's not very realistic, this description, but the imagery is of battles. <clears throat> and then the first line is quite ironic. We haven't seen irony. I hope to see some more irony in other poems to show you. Irony is just saying one thing and meaning another in its most simple form. And here we have that very first line, right? I tear her tattered ensign down. Okay, he's saying, tear it down, tear this whole thing down. But the truth is, the author does not want that to happen. He wants the readers to rethink that position. So, But by starting by saying the opposite of what he means, he wants to emphasize what a silly thing that is to feel that way. And he goes on in the rest of the poem. And in the next two stanzas to sort of talk about what a great ship this has been. So how could you possibly think that tearing her tattered ends and down was a good idea? And the last thing um, to talk about from me uh, in poetic element, and I didn't know what to call it, but it is kind of a twist. It, this last stanza sort of shifts, right? As I was reading, one thing that really surprised me is, so he starts off ironically saying, let's tear her down. So what's the opposite of tearing something down? It's to save it, to have it continue um, to live, which is exactly, by the way, what happens, right? So that's exactly what happens, that it is still in the ocean today. Um, so Oliver William de Holm succeeded very much, but his last stanza doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. It's a twist because it's unexpected. Instead, this last stanza moves on and says, no, better that her shattered bulk should sink beneath the wave she should just go down to a watery grave. That's basically what that is saying. So that twist there is not what is expected. So that's pretty um, surprising, right? That's what's called a twist. So let it be buried at sea. And what that does in this twist is this kind of last line here, more universal connection, just saying that 
we're moving now from thinking about just the USS Constitution itself, but thinking about human beings. And as we're older, we should be able to allow to die as we lived, right? Just die in the sea which where you fought all your battles. Don't be dismantled and put out to pasture to rot slowly. So it turns to a bigger, so the symbol, as I pointed out in the very beginning, the USS Constitution ends up sort of representing um, more than just the ship or the United States. It represents all older people, maybe talking about a dignity of an ending. So the topic gets a lot bigger than just this moment of freedom. So again, the purpose of these um, this uh, lecture is to try to highlight for you the um, ways you can read these elements in the poem and how they will help you to identify what the poem is trying to say. And one thing that the poem is trying to say is that something this beautiful and this important has lived an important life should be respected and allowed to uh, die uh, a death. That's one meaning. Um, another one could be just stop dismantling it. But all of these meanings are edified or highlighted when you consider the form and the symbols and the alliteration, the sounds and imagery, um, which is what essay one, or sorry, essay two now will all be about.